Peace has come. Take one. Wrong way. <laughs> Is this supposed to be the other way? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh, well.
All right, good morning. Hi, I'm Pastor Nate from Parkway Church. This is Pastor Jeff from The Gathering. Uh, some of you have noticed we've done some joint services together in the past, and so here we are, December 26th, just coming together as two churches worshiping the same God in the same community. That's right. Typically for the gathering, the last Sunday of the year, we take that off to kind of bless yep. our volunteers. I think you guys do something Same similar. thing. Go home. Spend it with your families. I hope you're yeah. watching this at home in your pajamas, coffee, eggnog, yeah. fruitcake, all that stuff with your family. Just enjoying time together. But this morning we thought, hey, instead of just canceling everything, we can still do something online. We're kind of used to doing stuff online. Yep. We've been doing that a bit over the last couple of years. Yeah. And uh, we share a youth pastor kind of. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, our family pastor, Pastor Gavin, I mean, previously it was myself, so some of you at the yeah. gathering already know me, uh, your students might know me, but uh, we have Pastor Gavin now, and he's been the joint youth pastor for both churches and just doing a fantastic job, so we've invited him uh, to bring the word today, a common voice for both churches. Yeah. So Parkway's obviously gotten a, a great opportunity to get to know Gavin, because he's a pastor here at Parkway. Where he, we're has an office here. he has an I, office here. I mean, everybody has here. an office here, you have an office here. <laughs> he's here every Sunday, but our people, apart from our kids who participate and youth haven't had the opportunity really to get to know Gavin yeah. all that much yet. So we thought, what a great opportunity for Gavin to bring the word this Sunday to bless both communities and for both churches just to get to know Gavin's heart a little and bit yeah, better. Yeah, really hear his heart because he's passionate about not only youth, but about God and sharing yeah. the gospel and letting them know who their God is. Mm. So. Good. Anyways, we got a couple announcements. Yep. So Parkway Church, January 2nd, we're going to be back on site. We're starting our new series called This Changes Everything. It follows a YouVersion Bible study, just like we did last year. And whatever scripture falls on Sunday, that's what I'm going to be preaching. So if you want to follow along, parkwaychurch.ca, you can find all the information there. Join the YouVersion Bible study, and it starts on the first Sunday that I'm preaching. So you're not missing anything if, if you don't make it until Sunday. Yeah, and we're going to be still online on January the 2nd. We've got Dr. Steve Brown from Arrow Leadership, who's preached at the gathering before. He's bringing a message, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, coming Sunday online. And then we're right. going to be back together again in person January 9th at St. Effects, obviously barring any shutdowns, all that kind of stuff. Whatever obviously. COVID brings us, we'll, we'll, we'll roll with it. We'll deal with that. But assuming and hoping that we're able to be together in person again, we're going to be doing that January the 9th, starting a new series called uh, first things first, talking about what our priorities should be in the new year it's good. It's good. as we enter into that uh, together. So it's going to be great. And then giving. How can people give to Parkway? Parkwaychurch.ca, the gather or Parkwaychurch.ca slash give and the gathering.com slash give. That's where you're going to find both opportunities to give if there's any end of the year giving that you'd like to do to bless the church, bless the communities, because that's really what we do with this giving. It's to bless the communities around us and, and make sure that they know the love of Christ through us, uh, not just right. the church, but you, the church. Yeah, so prayerfully consider, as you always do, what you can do, how you can be generous as the end of the Absolutely. year wraps up for both churches. So Absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, let's read a scripture and, and move into a time of prayer and worship. Yeah. So this is Psalm 119. It says, Your compassions are many, Lord. Give me life according to your judgments. My persecutors and foes are many, and I have not turned from your decrees. Consider how I love your precepts, Lord. Give me life according to your faithful love. The entirety of your word is truth. Each of your righteous judgments endure forever. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you for that truth, that your word is truth. And yes, that God. we can trust in you. We can know you. We can know your word. We can experience your life in us as we look into your word. And so this morning, as we worship you through song, Praise and as God. we open uh, the Praise scriptures a little God. bit later, as Gavin leads us through the scriptures, we pray that you'd speak and that we get to know you more clearly. We thank you for Christmas, Lord Jesus. Thank you, and we Lord. thank you for the opportunity to be together as families. Just pray over every family, every person watching God. Jesus. Hope and pray they had a great day yesterday on Christmas and also today and in the, the days dear. ahead that they would be able to rest in you, rest together with their families and know your life and your love that you are Emmanuel God with us the truth in the flesh mm. we thank you for Jesus we thank you for giving your life for us we pray that you be honored and glorified in all that we say and do this morning as we worship you through song Jesus, and through wor Jesus. word we pray all these things in Jesus name amen. amen amen why don't you join us for worship
church in the gathering and anybody who may be listening to this today I hope you guys had a fantastic Christmas yesterday and I'm getting the impression that this must be an important message because try as I might I've run into about every tech problem I could possibly think of today while recording this not that I'm a techie person and can normally figure this stuff out but it's been exceptionally a lot today but I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak on what I'm speaking about today. And if you guys are thinking right now, who is this talking to me right now? Um, He kind of just started talking, expecting me to know who he was. I am Pastor Gavin. I'm the Family Ministries Pastor at Parkway Church. And I've got the opportunity this past year and a half to walk and do life with and have conversations with a ton of the youth from Parkway and the gathering. And it's, it's been one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And 
through this time, I've really had a lot of conversations with people, and I've realized the importance of talking about who God is and really setting a foundation from Scripture of who God is for our youth and for ourselves. Because I believe that when we know who God is, it transforms our life. It is literally life-changing. And this message that I get to share with you this week, this characteristic of who God is that I'm going to be talking to you about, has transformed my life in so many ways. And so I'm beyond excited to share it with you. And I just encourage you guys to reinforce for yourselves who God is and who he says that he is in Scripture. And that's exactly what I want to do today. So get comfortable. Maybe you have a comfy sweater like mine that you're wearing for Christmas. Put that on and let's just worship God together by receiving his word for us today. So if that means having a journal and a pen to write down, if that means whatever it means for you, would you just be in a posture of response to what God wants to do today? So today we are talking about God's love, but specifically we're talking about a certain type of God's love that he spoke about when asked about who he was by Moses. So in Genesis 15, there's the story of Moses coming before God and saying, I want to know who you are. And the reason he was asking that was one, he wanted to know who God was. He wanted to be his friend and know his character. But two, he wanted to be able to trust God and who God says that he is. And so in response to that, God actually said that he was going to reveal himself, his true name, to Moses in that moment so that he could trust him and know that he would go with him everywhere that he was. And so I think that's super important for us today. And so when asked who he was, God said this. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord. So our translations say the Lord, but what that actually means is Yahweh. Yahweh was God's personal name, and it means I am. And it's essentially saying that he is far above any other God being in creation. God is supreme. He is the creator. He has always been from all time. And so when we read the Lord, that is God actually inviting us into personally knowing his name, Yahweh. So it says Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And we could talk about each and every one of these characteristics today, but we just don't have time. And I hope we'll talk about them another day. But this is how God presents himself to Moses, saying, this is who I am. And what I want to talk about today is the abounding in love. So in our translations, that might say abounding in love. It might say steadfast love. It might say loving kindness. There's all these translations that are trying to translate the Hebrew word chesed. And the reason that the translations are different is because no English word or few words can sum up what all that chesed means. But it's really important for us to know chesed because that is one of the kinds of love, not only that God has towards us, but that God actually is. And I think that when we know that God is chesed, we can actually trust him with our lives because he is that. We can live for him because of this characteristic of his. And this is what chesed means. Chesed means many, many things. But a few of those things are this idea of enduring love or committed love. It's not love that fades away or diminishes over time. It's a love that holds to its promises to us. It, it's translated by Tim Mackey, the author of the Bible Project, as loyal love, that carrying the connotation of commitment and endurance and loyal to its promises. But it's also a love that is affectionate. It's loyal out of affection for somebody. It's a steadfast love. It's kindness. It's mercy. It's deep commitment to us. And so those are all 
the words that it means, but I think it's important for us to understand three things. First, God proclaims that he is that. And so I think it's important for us to grasp what chesed means so that we can live from a place of receiving God's chesed and so that it can change our lives knowing the type of enduring love that he has for us. But two, I think it's important for us to actually look in scripture and see how God actually is chesed, that it's his very being. Because I think we can sometimes hear God say that he is this, but we don't maybe trust that he is who he says he is. So I want to show us why we can trust who he says he is, that he is chesed. And then finally, I want to talk about how his chesed transforms our life. And I cannot get this across enough. This has transformed my life, living in his chesed love for me. And it transforms our life by helping us trust him with our life and giving us the call to make disciples and be part of his chesed, restoring the world and making the whole world know this love that he has for them. But to start, I want us to understand what chesed means. So I used words. I said, it's enduring love, it's loyal love, it's compassionate love. But what does that actually look like in practice? So in the Bible, chesed is used numerous times. And 75% of the time, it's talking about God, because God is chesed. That is part of who he is. But 25% of the time, it actually is referring to an act of chesed made by a person in the Bible. And so I want to look at one or two of those just so that we can grasp what this term chesed really means so that we can live in God's chesed. So the first example I want to take you to is this moment in the life of King David and his best friend Jonathan. So this is when David is about to flee from Saul because he's chasing him and pursuing him and wanting to kill him. And Jonathan is actually King Saul's son. So King Saul is jealous of David and doesn't want him to take his throne. And so he tries with all his might to kill and pursue David. And so David is here fleeing for his life. And in this moment, this final conversation that David gets to have with his best friend, Jonathan, Jonathan asks him, to maintain his chesed towards him, this love. And so this gives us a clear picture of what this word means. Because shortly after that, well, not super shortly after that, but after that, King Saul and Jonathan both died in battle. And so it might seem like it was too late for David to show this chesed towards Jonathan. But the Bible says that David showed chesed in this act that he did towards Jonathan. So after he was died, David was now king. He was appointed ruler of Israel. And he asks if there are any remaining surviving relatives of Jonathan. And there's one. And that's a distant relative of his. It's a grandson of Saul's. And Saul as you know, who's related to him, was the king before David. And so this person that David finds is the last living person who could actually dethrone David at that time because he's related to the old king and has a right to be king. But David finds him, and it says that he acted in chesed towards Jonathan, even though Jonathan is dead. This is the idea that this love is enduring. It lasts beyond even somebody's life. And it says that he adopted this relative of Jonathan's and Saul's. And he invited him into his family. He let him eat with them every night. He provided for him. He gave him status and cared for him. Meanwhile, this is the only person who could rightfully take his place as king. And that is a picture of chesed that the Bible uses to let us know what it means. It is this love that goes above and beyond. It's not just affection. It's a committed promise, but it even goes above. 
love and generosity in that promise. And that's our scriptural understanding of it. I want to give you a life scenario that might help you understand a bit better what has said means. So there's this illustration of this elderly man who finds out that his wife is ill, terminally ill, and he chooses in that moment to quit his job, to stay home, to take care of her, to bathe her, to cook for her, to do all the chores around the house, and to really take care of her. And that is a great representation of what Chesed is. It's this love he didn't, that isn't just obligation. He didn't have to quit his job to serve her. He chose to quit his job so that he could take care of her. And he also didn't just stay there and love her and be there with her. He actually acted in generosity to take care of all the things in the house that had to get done. And so that is the picture of this enduring love. And so that is God's chesed. It's this love that is generous, that is steadfast, that is committed, that goes above and beyond. But there's a story in scripture, an enduring story in scripture, that actually shows us that God is chesed. And that's what I want us to sit in today and talk about and hold on to. So walk through this story with me. So in Genesis 12, verse 2, God comes to Abraham, and he says to him, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. So in Genesis 2, 12 verse 2, God makes this promise to Abraham that is out of his love for him, this relationship that they have. But it's more than that because it's a committed promise. God promises that he's going to make him a great nation, which he does in scripture. God promises that he would bless Abraham, and he does. He gives the Israelites, a beautiful land. And then God promises that he will bless the earth through Abraham's offspring. And that's what I want us to look at today. The story of God blessing the world through Abraham's offspring. But just knowing that he's going to bless the world through his offspring isn't enough. I want us to actually see his chesed on display here. So if we jump forward to Genesis 15, God actually goes the extra step to make this promise official. He's going to make a covenant with Abraham. And this covenant that he's making is more than just a legally binding contract that he's making with Abraham. And it's more than just a love and affection towards Abraham. It's bringing those two together to make a covenant. And in our culture, in our society, we don't really see this very often. But the most similar thing to it is the idea of marriage, a marriage relationship. It is both a legally binding document and it's a relationally committed promise. And that is a glimpse of God's chesed, this covenant love towards us. And this is how it pans out. So Abraham is going through the rites of ceremony to make this covenant happen because in that day to do this, you had to, to make this promise, this covenant, you would have to basically tear up animals and put them on the ground. And essentially what you're saying in that moment is that if I don't hold up to my promise, I'm considered dead like one of these animals. That's the promise. Deep promise. We don't do that very often today. But what happens is that in the night, God actually puts Abraham to sleep. And it says that God through two symbols, um, actually walks through the animals himself. And what God is saying here is that even if Abraham doesn't hold up to his end of the bargain, God is willing to die to uphold his end of the bargain. 
to bless the world through Abraham. And I just want you to soak that in. So God here is saying that even if Abraham is unfaithful, God is going to be faithful to the point of dying so that this promise can be fulfilled to bless the world through Abraham. And that is God's said towards us. And then the rest of the Hebrew Bible basically leads us through story after story after story of the Israelites failing to maintain their end of the bargain, to represent him and show him to the world. They just gave in to worshiping other gods and chasing after whatever they wanted. And so they kept failing. But God, through all of this, was patient and faithful to his promise to bless them and bless the world through them. Even though they went through some trials and even though he allowed them to go through hardship, he still continued to bless them, to not leave them completely on their own. And his promise was still going to be fulfilled to bless the world through them. So though they wouldn't become the blessing to the world, Galatians 3, verse 6 to 19, tells us what this blessing really looked like. And I want you guys to listen to this because this is a big deal. This is God showing us who he says he is. When he says that he is chesed, that he is committed, enduring, faithful, loyal love to us, he means it. So Galatians 3, verse 6 to 19 says, So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of God, Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. That's the gospel. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So here, get this. This is what it's saying. The Christmas story is not just God humbling himself to come in the flesh. It's not, the life of Jesus is not just God being moved with compassion to love us and show who God is to us. The cross is not just God dying to take the punishment for our sins. His resurrection is not just him choosing to make a promise to give us eternal life. All of these things are an expression of God's faithful love for us. His chesed. All of these show that God was faithful to the promise that he made all the way back in Genesis 12. That he was going to bless the entire world through Abraham's descendants. Because Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. And this passage in Galatians goes on to explain how Jesus is this descendant. He is the seed of Abraham that blessed the world. And so we know that God is faithful to his promises because not only did he send Jesus into the world to bless the world, but on the cross, Jesus absorbed all the unfaithfulness of Israel, all the sin of the world, and he killed it as he was nailed to the cross. And when Jesus was raised to life again, he was literally blessing the world with the promise of eternal life, the promise of a restored creation through believing in him. And so Jesus shows us God's faithful chesed, his faithful love for us, embodied in Jesus, that he held true to the promise that he made thousands of years ago to Abraham, to bless the world and to give us a new, restored life. And get this, this is why this is so important to us. Because that is who God is. It's not just what he did once. He didn't just fulfill one promise, but that one promise shows us that God is faithful to every promise he's made. And it's not just that he's faithful because he chooses to be. He's faithful because it's who he is. It's his nature. 
there's this amazing moment in the Bible where God essentially says, I'm going to give up on Israel because they keep sinning. They keep going back to their old ways. And Moses says, remember your chesed. Remember the promise that you made to them. And it says that because of who God is, he relented. That is who God is. So you can trust any promise that God has ever made because God is faithful to them. Now that might not look like what we expect all the time. But God is faithful and we can trust him. So there's two things I want you to take away from understanding God's chesed for you. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. So right there, the God of faithful love, who's faithful to every promise he's ever made, is saying that if you die with him, if you give up the desires of your flesh, if you give up what you want in this life, that might look like your, your version of success, that might look like what you want to do, that might look like giving to others. But if you give up what you think is best and you believe in Jesus and ask him to lead and guide your life, then you will have eternal life with him. And there's another promise in Romans 8, verse 28. And it says that we know that, for we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And you might be here right now saying, I can't believe that. I have not experienced that in my life. But let me tell you something. God in the resurrection gave us a promise that lasts beyond this life. And so we might have to endure hardships in this life, but we can know that they're working out for our good. We live in a culture that's full of instant gratification. We have Uber Eats that we can call and have food delivered to our door. We have social media where we get likes on our pictures that are instantaneous. But you can't microwave character. In fact, if God were to make us perfect and innocent, we'd just die because there's so much sin embedded in us that it is a slow process to being made whole. And so even the hard things that feel like they're tearing us apart are God working for our good in our life. And the perfect example of this is the story of Joseph, where Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt, where he's imprisoned in Egypt, but then eventually, years and years later, he becomes super powerful there, and through him becoming powerful there, all of Israel moves there. They grow in number. They become the nation that they became because of that. That was all to fulfill God's promise. Even though Joseph didn't see it all in his lifetime, he lived that promise. All things were working for good, even in the years of suffering that he endured. And we can see this in our stories, too. From the age of 5 till 12 in my life, I had something called a cholesteatoma, which a cholesteatoma is basically this benign growth in your ear that breaks your bones of hearing or removes your bones of hearing so that you lose hearing. And so I was partially deaf for, from the ages of 5 to 12. And a cholesteatoma, like you have to go in and remove it. I had 10 surgeries because they keep regrowing. They keep re-eating the bones of hearing. And so when I was 12, the doctor went into my ear um, to do this surgery. And he found that there were no cholesteatoma and somehow my bones of hearing had regrown and reconstructed themselves so that I could hear. And he said in that moment that this is impossible. This can't happen. And I knew in that moment that God had healed my ear because God is faithful love. He does care about us. He is working things for our good. And for me, that was a symbol representation of the spiritual healing that was going on in my life. Because in that time, that's when I gave my life to Christ. That's when I started living by faith and not by sight. And now, 10 years later, the doctors looked in my ear and they noticed that there's a cholesteatoma potentially growing again. But here's the thing. I know that if God did it once, he can do it again. But I also know that if God doesn't heal my ear, that he's still working things for my good, 
even though I can't see it, even though it's a longer process than I may expect. And in my wife's life, she's been going through this really horrible time uh, since we got married, not just because we got married, but because she's been having health issues over and over and over again, and no doctors can seem to determine what it is exactly. And through this experience, we keep praying, we keep asking for healing, but we also ask that God would show us what he wants to do in this time. And over the past few weeks, even though she hasn't been healed of this, she's been able to minister to people going through similar things in ways that she never would have been able to if she had never gone through this herself. And so even in the hardest times, God is working things for our good, and God has a plan that is far bigger than this life. And he calls us to be part of it. And that's the second thing I want you to get today, is that we can be part of God's plan of spreading his said to the world, of spreading his faithful love and his restorative love and his promise to the world. We can be his hands and feet who bless the world through him, through Jesus. I don't know about you, but I can't hear of God's chesed and not want to just tell everybody about this love that endures, this love that doesn't give up. Love in our culture is so temporary. There's no endurance. There's no commitment to it. It fades away so fast. But we know that it's in God's very nature to love us forever. And so I want you to share that message with the world today. I want you to be part of what God is doing and sharing this restorative love. I want other people to know that they can have eternal life with Jesus through the God who is faithful in love. And so as we close today, I encourage you to trust God with your life whatever you're going through, surrender it to him and ask him to use it for his good and lean into his love for you and the relationship that he has for you. He wants to point you to himself, to his love. Second, I want you to share this good news with everybody that you know because the world needs this love. It needs this promise and our God is faithful. And then third, I want you after this, I'm going to put all the scriptures up here so that you can, one, evaluate them, evaluate them, and two, so that you can soak in God's promises for yourself. And I want you to read his promises in the Bible. Don't take them out of context, but read his promise for you and allow that to wash over you and transform you and help you have faith that he is working those things out. And so thank you for listening today. Thank you for worshiping with me today. Now go out and trust in the promise of God over your life. He is so good. Dear God, I thank you for your faithful love, for your chesed towards us. And I pray that you would help us to spread this love to the whole world and to trust your promises over our life. And may we build a firm foundation through that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.